Hello and welcome. Really do I have an opportunity to have such a wonderful, inspirational group to chat with. Uh, Sadhguru, a man who's um, taken India by storm with your uh, brilliance. Um, you are diversity personified, so we'll be talking about your pluralism. Has no religion has never prayed to God in his life. Not to anybody else. <laughs> or to anybody else. <laughs> Malvika, an absolute inspiration for all of us. God bless you. And uh, I hope that you will put these gentlemen in their place during the course of the <laughs> next one hour. Shashi Tharoor, perhaps the most articulate not only politician, person that I've ever heard, um, ranging from all kinds of topics, and we shall test you today on pluralism and diversity. And you be better be as good as you are on the British. <laughs> 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 and Dietrich, uh, you know Melina Dietrich, that's his uh, sister. <laughs> You'll be so lucky. <laughs> He's a professor and has studied India for just, uh, uh, South Asia, for just 40 years. So he knows more than all of us put together and <laughs> is certainly less biased than all of us. <coughs> Can I start with you, Sadhguru? Um, you've just been traveling around India, you've just, you've, I mean, one month on the road. Tell us your experience about the pluralism in this short period of India, uh, that you've been around India, what have you learned? Namaskaram to everyone. When we say plural, uh, generally people are understanding this as uh, maybe three communities or five communities living together. But that's not the nature of India's pluralism. Because within the family of five, they have five different gods and goddesses going. <laughs> so, <laughs> our pluralism is very individualism in many ways. Because this culture has always encouraged seeking. Seeking cannot be en masse, seeking is always individual. You cannot make a crowd seek something, you can make a crowd pray, you can make a crowd do something else, but you cannot make a crowd seek something, seeking is always individual. This being the fundamental ethos of this culture, we must understand this that these are more recent happenings probably in competition with everybody else in the world, otherwise this is a land which has always been a land of seeking. The highest values in this land have always been truth and liberation. Just in the previous generations, if you heard my grandmother talking, not some spiritual discourse, I'm saying daily conversation, without using the word karma, mukti, prarabdha, moksha, without this no conversation ever happened. <laughs> so it was so much a part of our way of living that <coughs> holding not God as the highest value, but mukti or moksha or liberation as the highest value. And any god? Hmm? Any god you have… No, we Ishwar, know the technology Allah. of god-making, but there's never been a god in this country. All the people that we worship are people who walked this geography at some point of time. They went through the trials and tribulations that all of us went through. In fact, probably they faced much more drama than what's happening in most of our lives. And uh, we are not uh, bowing down to them for… because they were, uh, you know, superhuman or something. They were human but not trampled by life that is here. And uh, today, you know, many people say, uh, Sachin Tendulkar is a cricketing god. That's very much in line with our culture because here, when we said a deva, we meant someone who has excelled beyond certain limits. They have excelled in such a way that most people think they are above humanity. 
Right, but I think a, a, a quote of yours which describes India is a kaleidoscope of chaos, right? <laughs> See, when we say chaos, the choice is like this. You can have a society which is like a manicured garden and you need a gardener to take care of it every day, to trim you into place every day. Or you can have a society which is like a forest, which will anyway last for a million years without anybody's care or concern. So we are like that. We are a jungle. Right. And no tending is needed. Nobody needs to manage us. We somehow go on. Mr. Shashi <laughs> Tharoor, um, in this forest of diversity that India is, I prefer the word diversity to pluralism because I find <laughs> it difficult to get my word around, uh, tongue around that. Um, it is, as he says, it is India. And is our idea of India, are there anything worrying you to these days? Um, yeah, now because... That, now I, that the British have left. I think, in fact, I think Sadhguru's metaphor is a perfect one because it, the problem we seem to have these days is that there are some people who are coming into our jungle and trying to turn it into a manicured garden, into a garden of their design and, and, and of a particular shape which admits no other shapes, which is where I think the pluralism debate starts. Uh, it is uh, about the various ways in which people define themselves. Religion is very much part of them. Um, but identity in our country takes multiple forms. We have regional identities, uh, which also require pluralism. We have caste identities, which must coexist with each other. We do have religious identities and religious differences. And there are some who seem to say that people of, of certain religions have more rights in this country than those of other religions. Uh, we have uh, also um, diversities when it comes to things like what Malvika is going to be talking to us about, uh, disabled people and their rights. And, and, and are we ready to accommodate them in the same way, give them the same place in the sun the rest of us take for granted. So all of these diversities are part of Indian pluralism. I wrote in India from Midnight to Millennium more than 20 years ago that the singular thing about India is that you can only speak of it in the plural. And there is not just one India, there are many Indias, just as Sadhguru said, multiple ways of experiencing India, of the reality of India, the history of India. This is one and, of the most beautiful of aspects of India is its diversity, its Absolutely multiculturalism and everybody living together. But you still, Malvika, I don't want this to be purely just about religion because there are so many aspects to diversity and inclusiveness. Uh, diversity is a fact. It will always remain diverse. But will there be inclusiveness? Will everybody be inclusive and in an equal space? And you find some challenges there and that India has to learn a lot in that space? I think the most critical barrier that each one of us face is the barrier of attitude, the discriminatory attitude. And it is not just people with disability. Everyone faces societal attitude and uh, people with dis disability especially have a double disadvantage because more than their own functional limitation, the barrier of uh, uh, societal attitude is more of a hindrance to them. And I can vouch for this and I share my personal story here with all of you, uh, 15 years back uh, when I, I survived a bomb blast and I was in the hospital bed, I was lying in the hospital bed and the first time um, I was uh, inside the general ward, I heard a bunch of women whispering, uh, did you see that new girl who just came into the ward? What a shame, her life must have been cursed to deserve such a fate. Who is ever going to marry her now? I heard those words and I cried my eyes out. I so didn't. Before that, the pain the, that didn't you didn't cry. I that didn't, happened. I didn't cry when I found, saw my hands covered in blood, my amputated hands covered in blood. I didn't cry when they were drilling iron rods in my hands. I never cried. I was battling for my dear life. I did not cry. But when they said that I am a dependent girl, and uh, I am cursed, and uh, no one is going to marry me, so these were the things that absolutely shattered me and I cried. And well, I, I would like those ladies to hear you now and we are so proud of you. God bless you, I think. Thank you. It's amazing. You're an inspiration to all of us. But you still find that attitude needs changing. This in, and also mental health. Uh, that is, I think that is something each one of us here undergoes at various de varying degree of intensity. It's not some serious and some even even low. Like for example, there are so many uh, mental disorders and there's I so much stigma. I think our politicians have a lot of mental health problems. Sorry. <laughs> and there's different. so much stigma. <laughs>
<laughs> attached yeah, to it yeah we know deepika padukone has done a lot of good work she in that she was talking area. here today yeah. about that and how much uh, people you know they refrain from going to uh, going for treatment just because you know they'll be judged or you know they will be th- they'll be thought by the society that they are not fit so you know these kind of stigma i think this is something that is a very important topic in india as well and people with any kind of societal stigma that comes attached it it hinders with their day to day life they sometimes i when i was conducting my phd research i even understood that people wanted to move they wanted to move places move their workplaces move from their society because they could not take the stigma that was present in their society right. so they could not even live comfortably in their own homes so that's another aspect of attitudes can be and against religion can be against different sectors of society caste as you mentioned um you're used to manicured gardens right <laughs> <laughs> not really not really thank goodness um this build a wall we have a, a saying um where the mind is without fear and let us not be broken up by narrow into narrow fragments by by domesticated Broke walls. Broken into fragments by narrow domestic domesticated walls. walls, yes. Is that happening around the world now? We, I mean, uh, Germany has been seen a transformation. You took in a million refugees. Uh, the, the leader who took them in won the election, but the right wing also did well. So are we seeing um, a slight global phenomenon, a backlash, a kind of, uh, do you see a commonality? Uh, obviously there are certain features uh, which uh, we share around the world uh, there is this explanation now that uh, through globalization where uh, barriers are breaking down where there is a difference in the job market and the way employment works uh, a certain number of people is feeling left out of this development and uh, in a way to blame somebody else yes and uh, we can see this not only in the east also in the west not only in the gl- so called global north but also in the global south and people try to defend themselves and revive their identities in face of the open borders uh, mobilizing their cultural and religious and other identities right. one of the in a way i just wanted to sure, add this please. one term sometimes one could even call this movement around the world it's almost like an insurgency of the people who have been left out mm-hmm. uh, in this right. process of globalization right. and Insurgency politicians and have a... not been able to address them yeah one of the aspects i've read about about people who come from europe and uh, uh, from america is that they're coming they're worried they're coming to an india there's a pakistanization of india what do they mean by that i am not sure exactly um, what they mean by that but um, what i can definitely see is that there is a growing emphasis on uh, aspects of mutual exclusiveness and mutual exclusion whereas uh, this is a very short sighted approach because if we are talking about about globalization where borders are breaking down we actually have to turn this what some perceive as a challenge this plurality into an asset that where the physical borders are not really that meaningful and at the least they cannot protect us from the challenges in what we are living right. in right sadguru in this chaos and anarchy and beauty and and uh, diversity of india are we a bit worried that we are building these walls and how do we <coughs> stop them from being built it is not uh, the reality of india i know it's definitely become a discourse in a segment of the society but when you go down to the villages when you go down to just ordinary people this doesn't exist at all i hear people shouting over each other in the television rooms uh, you know saying so many things which is absolutely no meaning not on ndtv no <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, Sorry, I had to give a quick yesterday, run at NDTV. <laughs> yesterday, Vikram was holding a debate and uh, somebody was trying to speak over somebody. He said, please, it's wrong channel. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> All right, I get that. But… Uh, But you're saying that's not a reality on the ground. That's not the reality on the ground, not at all. It's just that, see, we are a nation with 1.3 billion people packed into 4 percent 
of the world's geography, we are nearly twenty percent of the population. So here and there, uh, we step on each other's toes. If I step on your toe, you don't have to be a Muslim to hit me, all right? <laughs> because that is… The, everything is scarce. From a… T everything, roads are scarce, toilets are scra scarce, everything is scarce. So we keep stepping on each other's uh, toes and here and there friction happens. But we must also understand, we are a largely unpoliced country. Correct. We are an unpoliced nation, there's really no police. There's no punishment. No, that's not the point. I'm saying there is no law enforcement to stop something happening. Right. Only after it happens, the police will come. You've even seen in the movies, only after everything is done, that's when they come, <laughs> all right? <laughs> because uh, for uh, the population that we have, we don't have that much of law enforcement. Right. So in United States, if something happens, if you give a ring in, they say the downtime is three hour, three minutes and twenty seconds. Fully armed police will be there in less than that time in most places. But if you call here, uh, <laughs> only for the wrap-up. <laughs> so we are not a police state. For that, I think we are an extremely peaceful country, unpoliced. Right. But everything is scarce, there's enormous poverty, deprivation. So here and there skirmishes happen that not necessarily because of uh, re differences of religion, caste or creed, mainly for economic reasons, there will be rubs here and there. Right. Uh, Malvika, uh, people who are disabled, religion goes into the background, right? Mm -hmm. There's much more, they've got many more challenges. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of lessons to be learned from how you fight because people with all the advantages just target each other for unnecessary reasons. So, uh, give us an, uh, some lessons that you learn mm -hmm. for the rest of us that how do we fight these, fight against building walls, building walls against um, disability, building walls against mental health people, building walls against religion, minorities. Mm -hmm. How do we break down these walls? Because India is not a country with walls. Mm -hmm. uh, I think once this, once the Maya of societal attitude is removed, I think each of us, and I'm speaking from the disabled community, each of us will be more aware of what we deserve in our society. And uh, I am a product of inclusion, and I'm very proud to say that even though I had my bad moments, I was excluded. And but today, I can very proudly say that I'm a product of inclusion, and India the number of things that have made that had made me feel this way that made me feel included i think first and foremost uh, education education is indispensable for change i believe that sharing of uh, uh, success stories sharing of role models positive role models uh, including but you're saying in education so important and you're quite right but education in education, they should people should be taught inclusion, right? Yeah, inclusion. Yeah. Talk about uh, Deepika uh, earlier today. She was mentioning that how in schools we should it it should be a more well-rounded way of education. We should not just target on you know math and science. We should also have you know teach uh, teach children about life skills, about mental health. And I am here advocating for uh, including disability studies in schools and colleges because disability studies is what makes us understand that an individual it is not an individual deficit per se, but uh, disability is a byproduct of the society and its right. environment and you know right. the ideology so we need to include disability studies and i also f seek private and private internships and all the private organizations and government and businesses that if we work towards inclusive hiring, if we work towards uh, standardization of technology so that in one office you have one particular way of working but you don't have the same in other companies. So I think all of this greatly helps, it has helped me in uh, being included in the society right. with my, my stories shared in the me media in a positive way. It has helped Very me, well it may have helped the readers but it has helped me further. Right. So it's a two way no, street. And your fight I think has helped a lot of other people who look to you and say, you know, she's done it and we can be included and we can we fight, can. which the, is a... Yes. Uh, but just, uh, uh, Shashi Tharu, just rather than just as a lovely concept and it's beautiful to have included, is it important for, for a country to move ahead or, or do countries do as well whether they've got walls built between different communities or is it an important part of progress? 
No, it's extremely important. In fact, you build a wall, somebody facts. will build a tunnel. You build a wall, somebody will build a tunnel, or they'll <laughs> right. find a way of breaking your wall. That's human nature. But more important than that, I think, is that for a society to function, all the parts of it have to feel relevant. They have to feel they have a stick. If you have people who've been left out for one reason or the other, whether it's disability, whether it's caste, whether it's because they're Adivasi, whether it's because of their religion or faith or the language they speak or the color of their skin, depending mm. on the society you're talking about. Well, it happens in India. Absolutely. Right. When, when people fair feel left out, they have no... Fair stick. and lovely ads are banned on NDTV. Good <laughs> we lose a lot of money as a result, but we will not accept that kind of racism on our channel. Yeah, it looks Excellent. like I'm the only That's one who didn't use it. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Sorry? It looks like I'm the only one who didn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I mean, the point is that uh, so all of these things, all of these kinds of discrimination essentially put people in a position where they feel they don't belong. They don't have a stake in the future and success of the society because they won't share in it. And that's what's wrong, because the, the, the practical purpose of pluralism is to let everyone feel involved, everyone to be a stakeholder in your society, and everyone to feel they're invested in the future of that society. Right. The moment you marginalize, alienate, push people aside, two things happen. One, you lose people who can actually build up your future. But second, you also potentially breed a viper in your bosom. There is no question that it's often the alienated uh, individuals in a society, the disaffected, the ones who feel left out, who are the ones who will turn against it, or at least give aid and succor to those who want to come and harm the society. Right. So in every respect, it's in the interests of any society to be as inclusive, as accommodative, as pluralism requires. There's a very a major university in America, in California, that's doing a simulation study about building walls, India walls that are built, built. And their simulation with artificial intelligence predicts a civil war in India in the next five to 10 years. Now, that could be all wrong robots, and they don't understand India. But the importance, I think, what Shashi Tharoor is saying is that it's important for progress. Take, for example, any survey around the world, what do people really, what do people know about India? Two things, Mahatma Gandhi and the Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal is a huge attraction for people from around the world to come, and now it's not in our tourist handbooks anymore. It's been excluded. Now, why, those sort of examples, do you find inclusion and not building walls crucial for India? Taj Mahal is not in the tourism. The U UP government has issued it's a tourist handbook that doesn't mention the Taj Mahal yeah. because, as you know, their chief minister last month or two months ago made a statement saying Taj Mahal is not Indian culture. They have a particularly bigoted and narrow-minded view. Now, of what he's is becoming Indian. political. I just want to <laughs> <laughs> rescue us all I, from that. <laughs> no, it is… Uh, it doesn't matter who built it, whether you like the people who built it or not. If somebody builds something beautiful, we must have an unprejudiced eye to appreciate it. When uh, Malvika repeatedly said, uh, disabled community, I want you to know, most of the society is disabled in their own ways. Okay. Right. <laughs> right. It's not uh, because you lost a hand or leg you become disabled. People are disabled. They tend to disable themselves in so many ways. So, uh, definitely, Taj Mahal is a, you know, a beautiful gem in anybody's eye. You cannot exclude that from India. At the same time, I also don't believe that you must say this is the only thing in India. If you come to India, Taj Mahal is the only place to see. No, it's a not. very narrow way of doing things. I think that's what has been done for a long time. And uh, it's time to change that by projecting everything else. There's so many but other… But definitely you can't remove uh, a beautiful but gem like… There's so many other beautiful Mahal. things, we shouldn't look at who built them, just that they yes. are beautiful right now. Especially if somebody whom you don't like built something beautiful for you, you must enjoy it even more. <laughs> 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 I worry a bit about you saying people you don't like. Huh? Is that… No, I'm saying if you don't like somebody and they build something beautiful for you, but are you talking isn't about there a, a double joy? <laughs> <laughs> but when you talk, say somebody you don't like, you're not talking about a community. No, no, I'm, I'm, about I'm an not individual. Say, I'm saying yeah. if… if uh, I mean, I did not know that Taj Mahal is pulled out of the tourism thing. I, I really did not know that. I'm saying the only reason why you may do such a thing is because you don't like someone who built it. 
because there is a history of invasion, there is cruelty, there is… there are terrible truths of the past. Uh, Sessi has been… Uh, I have yet to read the book, I have the book, but uh, I've heard him speak here and there about all the things that have been done during the British era, which is very cruel. Absolutely. But if we go to UK now, we don't hate those people. Yes, they have done this to us, we should never forget it. We should never forget it. This has been done to us because this should not be done to us once again. But it does not mean today's generation of English people, we have to hate them. Correct. No, mm -hmm. that's not it. So the yeah, same goes… could give us the Kohenur back. That's the least you could <laughs> no, have done. No, that is the <laughs> that same <laughs> goes for Islamic invasions. They've done terrible things to us. But we don't have to forget it. We should not forget it. Because also, we they stayed and became us, Sadhguru. Huh? They stayed and became us. There were some invaders who came and looted and left. But for many of the people, such as the emperor who built the Taj Mahal, they are us. They are part of our soil, assimilated into our culture. See, I want you to know, if there was no World War II, British also would have stayed. So that doesn't mean that happened because of their love for you. Okay? No, but Sadhguru, they <laughs> sent everything from here back to England, whereas these people, even whatever they looted, they spent here. No, there no. is a difference. Uh, that is because it's another time when there were no ships. <laughs> <laughs> Technical there were problem, ships. wasn't it? No, no, <laughs> there, yes. there were ships, there were ships. Transportation <laughs> issues <laughs> Besides, they had a land route back home to the Fergana Valley, they didn't uh, use it. It's not easy to but go. But you say, whether they did or not, one should not hate them now and should not build walls around see, them now. Is that, what, is that your message? See, what I'm saying is, historically many ugly things have been done by different people. Quite right. Ugly things that have happened to us as a nation, right. we must remember. Now, ugly things we've done to ourselves also. That also is there, that's another aspect. Right. What others have done to us, mm -hmm. we must remember, but we should not become bitter because this bitterness will destroy us. That's Why it. we should remember is so that we don't make the same mistakes and get into the same pit once again. That's very important for of me. Course. But at the same time, if if today, let's say, UK spoke the same language that it spoke during the colonial era, definitely we will not accept them. Unfortunately, with certain groups of people, they're trying to speak the same language which was historically spoken way back. So this creates a whole lot of confrontation in the society. And uh, this… this entire misuse of this for democratic purposes, uh, when I say democratic purposes, because it's all a number game, so people are playing this game for last seventy years. So naturally you have kind of brought this little bit of fear in others. Fear means people are seeing what's happening in Iraq and uh, the Islamic State and stuff, what happened in Kashmir. So people think if these numbers increase, this will happen to us also, because it's happened in the past. So I feel if one thing stops, I think this entire little bit of heat going on between communities will die, that is, you don't try to change the dynamics of demographics. Just let it stay this for next hundred years. Without anybody trying to increase numbers, you will see everything will level out. This is the only fear. That's why there is reaction. What religion are you? Hmm? What religion are you? I never identified with myself with any religion as such, because I we must understand gone. this, religion is a very foreign thing to India. Because when you say you're a… You, if you have to belong to a certain religion, you have to believe something. But this has always been a land of seekers. We never ever believed anything. It doesn't matter even when the so-called divine entities came, when Shiva came, his wife asked a million questions. The Shiva Sutra is full of questioning. And if Krishna comes, uh, this man, his disciple is supposed to be asked thousand questions. Whoever came, no entity, however divine they were considered to be, could give us a commandment, only debate he got. Right, right. Because there was no a such idea as the God in our minds ever. Right. So there is no belief system, so how can you say there is a religion? So it's great that you're not a God-man and you don't have a religion, I think that's a huge… God bless you actually for that. <laughs> no, this… <laughs> 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 I, I was very serious, sorry. <laughs> no. I'm going to ask you a slightly sensitive question. 
Germany is wonderful today, but it has gone through its period where it built walls. And you had six, seven million Jewish people, and you built terrible walls and did terrible things to them. What lessons can the rest of the world... Of course, we have 180 million Muslims. We don't have six million. Uh, but what are the lessons one can learn? Because Germany has struggled with itself and come out of it in a, in a, in a wonderful way. What, level, what lessons are that diversity is fine, that you can learn from your history? Well, I think um, the two situations are not necessarily comparable uh, because, after all, there was a genocide and um, there is no way of uh, uh, making it uh, look better. And uh, one way definitely Germany uh, went through is to keep confronting the truth, uh, which is uh, uncomfortable and difficult. And even one, two, three generations afterwards, um, not easy at all. But it is something that has to be continued. It's a matter of policy. It's a matter of mobilization. It's a matter of But I think, of as Malvika was saying, it's also changing people's attitudes, right? And, and it, that's not easy, right? That's and the it tough is one. changing people's attitude, although it does not <coughs> prevent people from trying to catch back to old ideas, what they think they could mobilize for totally different purposes of today's world where we see a movement of migrants, Now you're talking of a bit religions. like a professor. This is a television channel. You have to dumb <laughs> down to my level. What do you mean by what you just said? <laughs> <laughs> okay. The you right see, wing in your country just did very well, the best it's ever done. Is that a worry? That is one thing that uh, people working for the right wing as politicians I mean, they have, uh, again, at one point or the other, quoted slogans, used language that makes direct or indirect reference to the Third Reich, to the language of the Nazis. But Germany is not the only country where we have seen those references. And this is not necessarily exactly the same type of uh, diversity and confrontation as we see in other parts, like in South Asia, between Muslims and Hindus or other parts of religions where a lot of issues are expressed in religious terms today, which are actually political and ideological, and which have a deeper rooting in, right. as uh, uh, our uh, friend mentioned, in social issues in terms of marginalization, where people are left out and where therefore they are rebelling. And yet, uh, still, it's not the same issue. I mean, a Dalit woman in the province uh, uh, does not, has a much bigger carriage to carry, baggage to carry, uh, than a Muslim man, let's say, in the city, in, in Delhi. So even there you have to have other levels of inclusiveness. Right. Uh, Malvika, I mean, we are all now getting back into the, the political and mm. the religious, which has a lot of hatred in it. Mm. And that's what is being combated on that front. On the front that you're fighting, which is uh, marginalization of disabled people, mm. it's more, it's more insidious, it's not hatred, it's not obvious, but it's just cutting out people with mental health problems, with uh, physical disabilities, just <coughs> alienating them from society. It's, it, and it's a tougher thing to fight because here it's so obvious. Mm. How, do you, how do you combat that? Because it's as uh, destructive for India. As a social activist, I would want to say that I want to keep repeating Inclusion, inclusion, like everyone here is saying, inclusion is not a rule that should be accepted. I think it is something that should be celebrated. Inclusion, no matter who you are, where you are from, or you know how you look, whether you have any body parts, whether you don't have any body parts, no matter what, you should be included. And this and is the message. I hate to say it, that Bollywood doesn't help you at all, right? I'm, I'm Bollywood, yeah, sorry? I'm actually waiting for Karan and Alia if they are here sooner, then I can talk about the very important point that I want to highlight that Bollywood, they do not portray people with disability in the way that they should be. They are portrayed as, as they are objects of charity or, you know, they are so dependent or they are made fun of. You know, mockery is something, not just Bollywood. Everywhere you see people with disability are made fun of and their disability is, you know, at laughed at by everyone. But that's not 
that's not nice for people with disability we yeah and that affects so many other attitude uh, people's attitudes that's i laugh at it my family my mother especially she taught me to laugh at my problems she taught me to laugh at everything that happened but not everyone can take it as lightly as it is and i think films especially must portray people with disability in a very positive way because you know movie media is the only platform that the young the gen the current generation and everyone in fact they see people on tv they read about them and that's when they know that oh this person how do people come to know about me they read about me and then they see that oh this person has not given up so she gives us hope so i think if everyone's story is highlighted like that if every person's story if every disabled person's story is a unique story unique of its each each one of right, them is one right. of a kind so if everyone's story is highlighted in the positive way that they deserve to and be and I, i think it's important they're not a, they're not disabled people they're people who are disabled people first you're a person are. like everybody else hmm. and they're a person who's muslim or person differently who's able differently able well, similarly i think it's now okay to say disabled but a person who's disabled not a disabled person Uh, I would person comes first. I would like to add the word here a lot of magazines and media channels they use the word wheelchair bound. It is so restrictive. Wheelchair bound is like kind of restricting you to a wheelchair but actually wheelchair helps a person to be free to be liberated. You are I when I speak to people who are right. on wheelchair yes. they feel liberated when they are on a wheelchair. So it is Well one good thing that television has done it's made I mean most anchors have got serious mental health problems. <laughs> and I think That's this is not a confessional it is a <laughs> <laughs> i actually think it's an accusation but you won't go there it's a total confession and i do want to come out in the open and say yes there's a lot of mental <laughs> problems here but getting serious as you never are <coughs> there are similarities between uh, exclusion of uh, and marginalization of disabled people who are disabled but there's also a very different kind of hatred that's exploited by wonderful politicians as well well i hope i'm exempt because i you are. i'm very much you passionately are, yeah. believe in inclusive i'm India also exempt I, from the health problem i don't <laughs> <laughs> i don't i don't like to demonize anybody especially for things they can't help right. i mean demonizing somebody for the faith into which they were born or the community in which they live or the way they look or the color of their skin or the language they brought up to speak or the clothes they But wear what, or the what food what they eat sadguru says just a fear it's a fear So I was intrigued to hear Sadhguru say that because obviously some of the fear is stoked up it is stoked as you yourself said mm. partly for political purposes no. uh unfortunately there is often a politics of polarization that assumes that whipping up certain sentiments will gather certain votes for a particular community See, there yeah. is a politics of identity that says let's promote the interests of our caste alone or our group alone or our faith alone at the expense of others so i am certainly not expecting and uh, accepting the political process whatsoever from this but at the same time it is not right it seems to me to suggest that this is somehow natural it no. is actually no no, no baby is born intolerant somebody's teaching that baby its attitudes its beliefs whom to like whom to dislike and in the same way i think in our politics we are allowing some of our leaders to tell us whom to dislike and why for reasons that in fact in fact are not part of our of our daily lives you rightly said in the villages of india people live side by side and they don't feel any of this uh, hatred and unpleasantness is that a correct we interpretation of what you meant no because uh, not it's not take it wrong uh, again see i i don't wish to take a political stance because i've never associated myself with any political ideology uh, at any time not today so what i see is uh what we are today in many ways we are products of history we cannot completely eliminate it the british history that you have extensively spoken about written about the thing about the british is they exploited you commercially for them you were just a resource they had no other interest in you they don't care which god you worship whether you go to your temple or you don't go to your temple is it okay that they eat beef huh i'm sorry is it okay that they eat beef is if they have a wrong choice of food it's up to you what's my <laughs> problem <laughs> so anybody can eat beef is their choice is that of what course. you're saying okay of course no what i'm saying that goes against what no, no, a I lot of come. people feel I'll, i'll come to that we can uh, we can look at that later this aspect but when it comes to this religious invasions that happened whatever the thought behind that that thought you must surrender 
You see, if I do something horrible to you today, ten days later if we meet, at least I must show some regret or remorse in what I have done. When I am proud of what I have done to you, this is not going to settle, all right? This is what you are expecting. When people are very proud of what they have done to you in the past, now you want it to settle, it's not going to settle. It is just… I am saying it will just be an academic debate. It is not going to be a social reality. I am not interested in any debate unless it's a solution for the problems that we are in. So what's the solution? The solution is… the important thing is, you can do whatever you want, but you have no business to tell me what I should do, all right? And vice versa. Everywhere. I'm saying… I'm saying for anybody. Yes, yes. Essentially, this is this. Because people believe certain things, because everything that you have to ever know in the universe is written in one book, uh, people are insecure about that because we know what's written. The question is not whether everybody is like that or not. We're just afraid one day book will play upon us. So one thing that you have to do is, first thing, whatever the past cruelties that have been done, many things, it's not a simple process. Right. See, people have forgotten what has happened in this Delhi, what has happened in one afternoon. One afternoon, twenty thousand people were killed in one… one of these days, you know, one… three… three centuries ago. People have not forgotten these things because they know what will happen to them. And what has happened in Kashmir, people have not forgotten. Maybe people try to act like it didn't happen, but it has happened. So, well, if the demo demographics don't change, you will see everything will settle down. The thing is continuously people in a very strategic way trying to change the di demographic dynamic, now people are afraid because they know if the numbers increase, what will happen to them? So just don't do that one thing, you will see all problems will settle, believe me. Right. Uh, I know the communities very well. Right. At least you're positive and optimistic about it, but you do bring a lot of history into what people's fear today is, and that is a bit worrying. There is a Buddhist uh, tale about two Buddhist monks walking down the road and they come to a part which is very… a lot of mud and water and there's an old lady there and she wants to cross. And one of the monks <laughs> takes her on… I know. <laughs> uh, takes her on his back and takes her across and while she… The, he's taking her across, she kicks him and beats him and says, you're hurting me, don't go this way and, you know, curses him and shouts at him. Finally goes around, uh, puts the other side and puts her down and the, both the monks walk on. And after two hours, uh, one monk says to the older one, you know, that lady was so horrible and you didn't say anything, you just… you just let her go, why didn't you say something? And he says, you're still carrying that lady? I put her down two hours ago. Mm. Shouldn't you put down your history? That's… that's what I said. Just I put think, it down. I think that story is totally not relevant to me. No, no, <laughs> of course not, of course not. <laughs> not relevant to the situation either because the story is not… the… the situation is not about what happened. The situation is that there is no sense of remorse or regret about what happened. You want the lady to regret? Uh, not the lady. See, th that's a totally different… So I think uh, I have a better way of telling that story. That's a… that's <laughs> a… You have a better way of telling most no, stories. No, no, not, that's not the point. That is a spiritually significant story, that's a different matter. Okay. This is a reality which we are living in, where people who firmly believe their way is the only way to go to heaven, all right? First of all, I'm not interested in going to your heaven, <laughs> so leave me alone. But you keep on trying to change the demographics there will be fear. If you think that is an empty fear, then you have to see what's happened. What is happening even now in certain parts of the world, you must see. It is not an empty fear. So I am saying, whatever you believe, it's your so faith. So you say… I, first of all, let me finish this. Sure. I feel you, the moment you believe something, you are disabling yourself because belief essentially for me means you are not straight enough to admit you do not know. As far as I'm concerned, either I know something or I don't know something, that's all there is. Everything that you don't know, you believe and you want me to believe the same thing? No. So this culture has never imposed anything on anybody because nobody believes anything. We are seekers. Seeker means what? You can be a genuine seeker only when you realize you do not know. So this is of a certain nature. Now in reaction, unfortunately, 
we also tending to become like that, which is a very sad thing, okay? But at the same time, a society is not made by… till now at least, maybe in future it might. Society is not made by spiritual wisdom. Unfortunately, <coughs> it's made on the streets, how people react, how they fight, how they defend themselves, what they can preserve, what they cannot preserve. In this… this is how societies are made still. It's a crude way of doing things, but that is how it's made and that's how it is still now. But Till didn't you just that. say earlier that you've traveled around <coughs> India recently and throughout your life, even as a young man, even you were on a motorbike, people live with each other in complete peace and harmony and without fear, without thinking of the history and without thinking even of numbers. Even now it is true. And Shashi says that… I'm telling then, you, even now it is true except yeah those communities which are kind of little ghetto, except in those places, everywhere else, even now it is true in this India, just now thirty days I have driven across the country. Right. Even now it is true, every kind of people, every kind of community, community leaders came to me and spoke to me and I have spoke to them, all this happens. Right. I am saying, one thing is a whole lot of people, particularly, I am sorry, he said, he says, <laughs> political class is trying to exploit the differences, all right? I think you agree on that. I think I, I agree with Sadhguru. The thing no, is that no, when, when you I say political class, I don't mean to say every political person is doing it. After all, right. politics is a dirty Sadhguru, job that somebody is doing for us because <laughs> we are not willing to do it. That's right. So someone <laughs> like you who has such a major role in society as a Sadhguru, should you and others like you not take on the role of uh, educating people to overcome the fears you mentioned? I mean, the fear of democracy <laughs> is even mathematically an absurd one. Eighty percent of the population is Hindu. How can they be afraid of a small minority of a smaller minority? And what is the demographic calculation by which this number can overcome us? Uh, Should we not educate I'll, them to I'll leave you. their fear behind and say, look, let bygones be bygones, as he said, put that baggage down. You referred to Nadir Shah's attack in Delhi, 1739. I've written about the British attack in Delhi, 1857. But if we can forget the British, let's forget Nadir Shah too. No, no, we can forget it. We just have to make sure it doesn't get repeated, that's all. I will tell you what's the fear. But you're not justifying hate. I am not right? justifying. Thank I'm God. saying Thank God. That's fine. first and foremost thing is, whatever people have done historically, we don't have to hold it as a reality today. Correct. Only thing is, all communities should distance themselves from that historical <laughs> events. But I will tell you, wherever there is a certain majority, they will… you will see all other things get naturally pushed out, totally, which is not the way this country has operated. I am telling you in Tamil Nadu, if I go to certain districts, without asking me, the state provides me security. I say, why? Sir so, Sadhguru, you don't understand certain communities are saying you are coming and you will convert them into something else which is not their way. So they put police around me. I say, what nonsense in… My, in India, why do I need police around me for me? They say, that's not the way it is. It happened in Tamil Nadu when I went to Kanyakumari. They put over three hundred armed police around me. I said, what the hell is this? I've never asked for security in my life, in Tamil Nadu especially. But they put armed police in a program where there are about twelve thousand people. I'm walking up and down the ramp and speaking. These armed men are walking up and down with me. <laughs> Yerchi, can I just uh, take on from that? There's one criticism of the West that, you know, they look at India and you call the Pakistanization, not you call, the West calls the Pakistanization of India's happening and it's a big worry. But there's a, a criticism which uh, is widely written in the literature that the West does not worry when there are attacks on Muslims, but there are attacks on Christians, they all react. <laughs> is that something that… is that a reality? Well, let's put it that way. Um, there are a lot of uh, reductionist perceptions through media and through politics. Uh, for instance, there is a lot of blame put on Islam per se or Muslim radicals per se, but it is often overlooked that the largest number of victims in terms of dead people are actually Muslims in this part of confrontation. And we also forgetting that this is also a byproduct of uh, international political polarization after the end of the Cold War. Um, a lot of analysts point to the fact that almost all military interventions after the end of the Cold War took place in countries and territories where Muslims live. And, Except uh, now we have the rocket man, right? 
and that is uh, of course now a different development That's but right. it means you cannot attach just one character one feature to a particular religion there are other people who are equally uh, scared of raising violence in the name of Hindu religion or of Buddhist religion we just had the Rohingya issue so there the tendency to be radical or violent can be expressed in, any, in the name of any particular ideology or religion. And if you look at the history of South, not even history, at the current times of South Asia, of India, you will see there are much, many more victims of other violent conflicts than of those connected with Muslims. Look at the Tamil uh, war, look at the other uh, insurgencies in East, uh, in the eastern states of India. Uh, so we will definitely see, unfortunately, also because all violence is unfortunate, it is rather evenly spread through religions, ideologies and faith and non-faith believers. They, they say the two, the two Ds of India are the greatest asset democracy and diversity. But one issue about democracy which uh, you must find very difficult is that it requires numbers. Mm -hmm. And you know, okay, there are 80% Muslims, a billion, Muslim, uh, billion Hindus, 80% uh, Hindus and 200 million, 180 million Muslims. And uh, how do you get a voice in policy making? I think that's crucial for um, people who are disabled or people with mental health problems must be in a position, otherwise it's people who don't understand the issue trying to make policies. How do you get into policy making positions? That's crucial. Yes, definitely. I think and that is something all of us uh, uh, from our disabled community, we are voicing and we are talking about that, that we need representation at the policy level because you cannot understand what our problems are unless we tell you, unless we tell you, and because we face it, we can tell you directly what our problems are, and policies can be, even the societal attitudes, discriminatory attitudes per se, so the policies even implemented on that basis are especially very important. And uh, I think to truly achieve an inclusive uh, uh, policy making or in, to have a pluralistic society. I think what we need to understand is uh, we are disabled by these societal attitudes and we need to understand that you know disability does not, it, it lies in the eyes of the observer not the observed and we uh, should talk about it and we know now what we deserve in our society and what are our policy concerns so where we need to be uh, included and be it school, college, Shashi everywhere. How does one have people in parliament who, I mean, there's, there should be a, a group who are facing the problems rather than others who don't understand it. No, really. we, we've tried to raise the issue in parliament. Frankly, I, I've, I've spoken out publicly against the failure of the government to pass the People with Disabilities Bill. We ratified the UN Convention, but we haven't actually converted right. it into our own legislation. And if you look around our country, but, uh, but the point disabled that people has has making ramps, is that people you know. like her should be in policy making positions. Correct. In a democracy, that means she has to get elected. But, but otherwise, tough, short right? of that, people who are elected can seek her advice, can get inputs from her, and, 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 and push those forward. Ideally, what we want is the government to listen to people like you. And I think the fact that you've now become so visible and people are hearing what you have to say means your ideas will gain traction. That's one strength of an open society. People will talk about you, will write about you, and your, your views will reach. But, but ultimately, do you, do you we face, need laws to change Do you things. face a wall that's again built that you can't find tough to break down to influence policy? Uh, to influence attitude, I have worked upon and I have noticed the difference because you tell one person, contact is very important when you want to sensitize people. So when someone sees me, they know that yes, they can change their attitude. But policy, it's a different whole different level and you know, we need to, we have uh, the rallies, we have like our groups, protest groups talking about our rights and very simple ones, you know, just the, the word that is being used to indicate us or you know, uh, to stand for national anthem every time when the movie is play, being played or to have reservation for us at, on lower berths uh, in railways. There are so many concerns. Accessibility, universal design, these are our very, very important issues. And I think accessible public transport and I think a number of these issues definitely need, uh, to, definitely need to be heard. And I think we still have 
uh, a long way to go, I would you say. You raise the national Can anthem. I say something? Sorry, please, yes. See, what uh, Malvika is saying is, uh, it's unfortunate that such situations still exist, but uh, policies can be made, but I feel these issues will be only settled by a more humane society rather than a rule, because a rule book uh, doesn't really work in this level of thing. That when somebody is incapable of something, you reach out to them is a natural human attitude. If we have surrendered that attitude for some reason, bringing it back in the social ethos is more important than fix a rule, because if you fix a rule, still it may not happen because that person needs that little help at that moment. So, I think it's a lot of work to be done in the society more. Well, I'm going to do something which I have not done before and uh, please excuse me if I get it wrong. Can we just stand for a second? Uh, I'll tell you when. Because I'm going to… In school, we used to always sing one… the second stanza of the national anthem, which we no longer do. And if you ask me, that stanza means more than any other stanzas and I don't know why we don't sing it. We just, I'll try and remember it. And you mean after it. the national anthem itself, what follows? It's part of the national anthem, actually. Which is the part? national anthem has many stanzas, we only do the first one. And we've given up this second, which we used to sing every time, the second stanza. And to me, when in this discussion, when we talk about building walls and communities and minorities, that stanza means a lot. And it is... <laughs> Aharahatab Avan Pracharita Sunitab Udhar Vani Hind Bodh Sikh Par Sikh Musliman Kristani. That's what our national anthem talks about. And we should sing it every time. Because that is India. That is the diversity of India. Why have we given that up? Uh, you mean to say, why have we given up the stanza? Yeah. Uh, that's because uh, they wanted to reduce it to 57 seconds. <laughs> Technical <laughs> not issues. Because, they should take not because standard. that's not relevant, that's still relevant to us, but uh, they wanted to make it less than sixty seconds. Right, right. So, and also they're singing it, uh, singing it uh, like speed national anthem okay. <laughs> <laughs> rapidly. So, I am very unfortunate. But yeah. I mean, that you said this. See, we must understand one fundamental ethos of Indian psyche. We don't really have a problem what, what God you worship because in the same family there are thirty-two gods and goddesses. And there is Ishwara Allah Tero Nam. No, that's okay, but I'm saying even before that. Yeah. See, every other form of whatever… I'll tell you one thing, you take one picture of uh, some pious looking man, usually they must be bearded if it's a man <laughs> and uh, take it and I'm give it to one old… I'm you didn't use the word God man. I'll come to that God man, I think <laughs> I should restructure that one <laughs> If you give this picture to an old lady in some village and say, this is a great sage, she will keep it in her puja room and worship without knowing who the hell he is. Do you understand? It's true. This is the only culture which does that. So do not destroy that by imposing something forceful, you have to believe this, you don't… you… otherwise you are not this or that. You don't have to believe anything to be in this country, okay? <laughs> You don't have to believe anything to be a part of this culture because everybody can do their own thing. That is, we know the technology of God-making. We… for every one of us, we made our own God. There's something called as Ishta Devata that you can create your own God or Goddess. That's true. If you like the tree, you can make the tree into your God, God. If you like a rock, you can make rock into your God. This is a phenomena. This is the most wonderful thing because this is a… this is a dimension of life which should never be organized because the moment it's organized, it becomes something else. So this we realized from ancient times and we made it in such a way it can never be organized. There is a desperate attempt to organize it but it's not working anyway. You cannot organize it because to organize something you need one particular belief system. There is no particular belief system in this country. But I think I'm glad, what Pranoy, that you linked this debate on pluralism to the national anthem because indeed nationalism is such a major issue in the world today, in our country today. And to my mind, uh, now what, I, <laughs> what I find you, myself… You've met your match. Oh, I see. Good. All right. Let, let's and have Sadhguru, the Guru's come. you've got uh, Aliyah Bhatt to compete with. <laughs> <laughs> Please come in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. welcome. Five seconds because we have… <laughs>
Yes, I don't uh, take question. She has applied to catch you, you answer your question. Just the five right. seconds. Yeah, yeah. Oh. You have a question. Hi, Karan. Hi. Hi. For both of you, Karan, question for you. You have to answer. Karan, yeah. have to answer. No, no, sit, 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 sit. Uh, thank you both of you for being here. My only, my suggestion rather is uh, when uh, I want more people with disability to be uh, shown in movies and to be shown in a positive way, to have more positive portrayal of people with disabilities because you are the people who are going to show each, it's, there are so many people who watch movies and I think you can directly impact a lot of people, a lot of people who have no idea about disability. So it's my request and it is something that I really wish for that we want more representation of people with disability in cinema and a positive portrayal as such. Well, um, I'm no filmmaker, I'm an actor, but I think I absolutely agree with you and I don't want to um, be saying too much, but I have to say I've already read two scripts in which there is very positive, very happy, very cheerful dis uh, 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 display of pe people with disabilities and um, hopefully I will play uh, some characters someday. Um, so thank you uh, for this suggestion because definitely it's very, very well taken and point noted. Well, I'm the producer I there can confirm that. <laughs> well, the man who makes films is hiding behind you. <laughs> well, I actually did, I did project uh, disability when I directed a film called My Name is Khan in 2010, uh, which dealt with autism, a strain of it, Asperger's syndrome. Yes. And we touched upon that and a fair amount of research went into, you know, the projection of that character. So I know what goes into it because, yeah, and I think that what's in, I think it's what's imperative uh, is that when you project a disability is to really get into the ethos of it and not just, you know, um, you know, sugarcoat it sometimes and yeah. just, you know, touch upon it because just for emotional manipulation because I think as a filmmaker that would be letting down the cause and what you're trying to do with the character. Most so yes, definitely point noted. Thank you, ma'am. Great. Thank you. Also, one more, just one more suggestion uh, to Karan actually. Okay. Uh, uh, in fact, like how would, how about... Uh, Having people with disability portray people with disability on screen. <laughs> so how about that for a change? Then the actor will not win the award. You're grabbing a chance I am a model, so <laughs> let's see. No, definitely. But thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. This so was much. truly an honor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all very much. Well, Bollywood's a great advertisement for Indian pluralism anyway, so keep it up. Thank you.